Attention all Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio listeners. The Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast brings you the best in East Coast esoterica on the first of every month. Together, we can keep it growing by sharing the show on social media, subscribing to the show wherever you may be listening to it from, and by leaving feedback about your favorite episodes. John certainly needs a friend like you to help make his dreams come true, minus the alien abduction dreams. That sh- is not cool at all. The Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. Always available. Always free. Always odd. It's the Odd, Odd, Odd to Newfoundland. Ghostly greetings from your host, Jonathan. Mysteries, ghosts, monsters, and lore. East Coast esoterica and so much more. If it's up to you, friend, it's on the up to you found line. <laughs> Ghostly greetings from the oldest city in North America. I'm your host, John Mallard, bringing you the best in East Coast esoterica. You, my friends, have stumbled upon the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast for the month of February 2017. Guys, welcome to the show. This is episode 37 of the Odd Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast, your monthly paranormal variety show that is always free, always available, and always odd. Before we dig in, of course, just want to shout out to our sponsors of our wonderful Donuts and Dragons Board Game Cafe. Thank you so much. This show is brought to you by Donuts and Dragons Board Game Cafe. Look them up on Facebook. Check them out. They are here in Newfoundland. They're here to stay. And uh, I want you guys to show them some love, okay? They are supporting this show, so thank you so much to that crew. Guys, I've got some wonderful news. Excellent news, because this show has transformed into something absolutely amazing. We are finally Podbean worthy. Get ready to cheer, because finally, finally, this podcast is going to be featured on Podbean. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Of course, I can't do it. I can't do it. I cannot do it without the support of all you wonderful people out there. On February 27th, I, Jonathan Mallard, and this show, the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast, will be featured on the Podbean app for a full week. That means as soon, if you were to download the Podbean app, as of February 27th for a full week, as soon as you click open that app, one of the first things you're going to see is the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal podcast. I'm going to be honest with you. Now is the time to subscribe on Podbean or wherever you're listening from because this kind of promotional help is only given to the best podcast with the greatest listenership and that's you guys. So thank you so much. It's an honor for Podbean to recognize my hard work. I mean, it's been a few years. I mean, this isn't a new podcast and I'm so proud to be able to say that we're getting featured. Guys, get excited. That's awesome. And just to throw it out there, if this is your first episode, or you've been a listener for over the years, you know, I just want to say thank you so much for letting me into your strange, twisted, paranormal loving minds. You, you weirdos. Thank you so much. Thank you so much because you know what? I'm a weirdo too and you haven't got to be alone. <laughs> so let's talk shop. How are things going in your world? Mine is actually going pretty awesome. This is January done. Over. Finito. We're heading into February. We're heading into the month of love of Valentine's Day. And, uh, you know, you got to get ready for that. And I'm going to throw this out there to you. I've been working out like a dog, trying to get back to the weight I was before Christmas hit. And I'm very proud to say that I'm actually down one pound I was before December 24th. So give me an oh hell yeah. That is awesome. I wonder how you guys are doing with your uh, New Year's resolutions. Mine was to keep getting healthier and to keep losing weight. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny because, you know, I actually started last month and, and put a gym in my basement. Now, I already had all the gear kind of hidden away. And, uh, you know, my biggest fear is that I'm always going to be, like, eternally paranormal and pudgy. So what I decided to do was set up all my stuff in my basement. And uh, it's been going really, really well. You know, the gym in the basement is right next to my haunted idol. And uh, all the way back on August 8th of 2014, my second episode, I interviewed Ryan Williams. And he was talking about cutting-edge wrestling. 
and uh, you know, just the the weirdness that was going on back then. That was the week that the Ultimate Warrior it was kind of around that time. The Ultimate Warrior passed away a little bit before that, and uh, it was so weird because he gave his own eulogy. So there you go. A shout out to Ryan Williams and Cutting Edge Wrestling, of course. Uh, the <laughs> the episode was was just called Synchronicity Ultimate Warrior, but that's beside the point. I digress. It was after that episode that he gave me this haunted idol. And uh, so the story goes, the spirit within supposedly grabs the asses. Yeah, your buttocks. It grabs the asses of whoever owns it. So here I am in my home gym doing squats with my suspension trainer. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, God, the idol's there. I'm bent over. I mean, please leave my ass alone. <laughs> the, the paranormal's taken over my life so much. I can't even work out without the fear of being on the receiving end of a paranal assault. <laughs> See what I did there? Receiving end. Yeah, <laughs> it happened, guys. Oh, boy. I, anyways, I hope things are going really well for you guys. And uh, listen, this this Podbean thing that's coming up on the 27th of February, this is the time to subscribe to this show. Let's grow this show. Let's make it more and more amazing. I know there's a lot of people out there who love this show, and they want to see it get bigger and better. And, and let's be honest, the more people that listen, the more people that are into this show, the sexier it's going to get. <laughs> Because it is getting close to Valentine's Day. And I can't think of a better thing for you to do than me than to give me a little kiss and subscribe to this super awesome show. Enough bantering back and forth. I've got to tell you a little tiny bit about our guest tonight, Mark McNichol, guys. Awesome guest. Um, in the show notes, in the show notes is going to be a link to Mark's website where you're going to see a little preview video of his upcoming film. And this is going to be awesome. If you're into psychic phenomena and stuff like that, you're going to love this film. So I want you to check that out. I want you to go to his website. It's there in the show notes. And no point telling me... I I could tell you the the, the website right now if you want, but realistically, there's no point. Go to the show notes after you're done listening to the podcast or before if you want and click on that and it'll take you right to Mark's website. And I really want you guys to check that out. Show him some support because this guy was an awesome, awesome, awesome guest. Okay? And uh, yeah, I want you guys to check that out because right now it's time to jump into the paranormal news. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm trying to lose weight, but there's nothing harder. There's nothing harder. And you know what? I know you guys are in this journey with me. I know you're you're getting healthier and happier, and you love the paranormal, but you know what? What if I told you I accidentally put on weight this month and didn't even know about it? Because scientists have actually discovered, I should say pinpointed, a new human internal organ. <laughs> yeah, this happened back on like earlier in the January, but I'm going to go ahead and report on it. The mesentery is found inside the digestive system and has only now, only this day, have been identified as a single organ. It's not every day that you find out that your body contains a mysterious, undiscovered organ. While the mesentery has been technically known about for years, it was previously believed to be a series of fragmented, separated structures rather than a single, continuous organ. The find was detailed in a new paper published in the Lancet Gastronology and Hepatology paper. In the paper, which has been peer-reviewed and assessed, we are now saying we have an organ in the body which hasn't been acknowledged as to date, said researcher J. Calvin Coffey. The anatomic description that had been laid down over 100 years of anatomy was incorrect. This organ is far from fragmented and complex. It is a simply one continuous continuous structure. While it still remains unclear exactly what the function of this new organ is, further study could offer scientists an improved understanding of how to treat abdominal and digestive disease. It's the basis of a whole new area of science, said Coffey, and with that comes hope for sufferers of various diseases. Now, isn't that interesting? Just imagine you got a brand new organ. I'm telling you. Like, this show is awesome. You showed up today, and you know what I gave you? I gave you a new organ. How do you, like, who can actually say that? Some of us are just full of organs, and other people are full of hate and anger. Yeah, I hate to go negative, but you got to hear this story about a man who beat the crap out of a alien. A man claims he punched an alien in the face. John Mooner insists that not only did he try to hit an alien, but that he was even, he even has the photographic proof. He got it from Google Earth. You got, it's about to get weird. It got weird, didn't it? It's about to get way weirder. Mooner, who is from Devon in the UK, the United Kingdom, maintains that he's been abducted multiple times by extraterrestrial visitors over the last few years after experiencing periods of missing time. Strange. The shocking thing about this, being abducted by a gray alien, and the satellite image clearly shows me trying to fight off the gray alien by punching it in the face. 
Looking at the image, it appears that the alien was blocked, and he's actually blocked my punch and has grabbed my fist. I was left speechless by what I saw. Suffice to say, however, the image is far too pixelated to make anything out with any degree of certainty. The two figures, for instance, could be little more than two items of garden furniture. Furthermore, even if the image does show two people, why should one of them be an alien? Despite these doubts, however, Mooner remains convinced about what happened. I was abducted, and this satellite image proves. It is proof of what I've been through. There you go. The man who... Beat the living crap out of a... Alien! Listen, you can't get through life without this giant laser. I want sharks with laser beams on their frickin' heads. Well, how about a thousand watt super laser that scientists have recently created? You know, this is actually really cool, and it's so glad to see science being used for something so important, such as cutting just about everything on the planet in half. The impressive invention is reportedly around ten times as powerful as any other laser of its kind. Developed by a team of British and Czech researchers, the High Peak Power Laser has been nicknamed by Boge after a Hercules-like character from Czech mythology. According to physicist Martin Devoki, the $28 million laser, which has been built by the highest research facility in the Czech Republic, should qualify as a new world record holder. Oh yeah, that's so awesome. It may even be considered evil. While its peak power is not as high as that of its two competitors, the Texas Petawatt Laser in Austin and the two Petawatt Laser of Fast Ignition Experiments, LFEX in Japan, Bivaj is able to maintain a much higher average energy output and does not require as much recharge time. Ultimately, the team behind the project are hoping to commercialize the technology for use in a variety of engineering applications, such as metal hardening and semiconducting processing. So, sorry guys, no lasers on shark heads. Whether it will also earn them a place in the record books, however, remains to be seen. Aw, oh, man, I freaking love that. I love weapons, especially ones that can cut people and things in half. Pretty much gonna say this, gonna throw that out there. I think as soon as you create a laser with that much power, it has military practical, you know, use... I got a feeling that's what it's going to be used for. <laughs> oh, my, oh, my. You know what? I got some flack last show. I'm not going to lie. I had people telling me off, basically saying you had too many animal stories in the paranormal news. Come on, John. Everything was animal stories. So what did I do? I went against the grain, and I found yet another strange, wonderful, and weird story about insects. This one is about an alien insect, and it's unlike any ever seen before, the find is so unusual that it has to be assigned a whole new branch of the insect family tree. Now, rather than just read this out to you, I'm just going to give you a little show notes and actually play a little clip from YouTube. I think you guys will like it. Now, this alien-looking insect, which is believed to date back 100 million years, was discovered perfectly preserved within a piece of amber, Jurassic Park, anybody, that had been unearthed by miners in Minamar. The insect has a number of features that just don't match those of any other insect species that that is known, said Professor George Penoir of the Oregon State University. With his long neck, big eyes, and strange oblong head, I thought it resembled E.T. I even made a Halloween mask that resembled the head of this insect. When I actually wore the mask out trick-or-treating, uh, you know, all the kids were scared, so I had to take it off. <laughs> so here you go. I'm going to play a little clip from YouTube. I think it's worth a play, and it's kind of interesting, so enjoy. The creatures around us at present weren't always around us. And there were many other kinds of creatures that existed in the past that we know nothing about that were fascinating. And it shows that what's around us now is probably only about 1% of the total life of animals and plants that existed during the history of the Earth. When I first saw this fossil, I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought it had to be an alien. And then I remembered E.T. And I remembered, oh my gosh, it's an insect in the form of E.T. It has the same type of head. It has these two large lateral eyes. It has a long neck. And uh, I went over and over trying to find some extent insect or another fossil that was similar, but I couldn't. And so I was completely blown away. I didn't know what to think. Studying an insect or plant in amber takes many steps. First of all, you have to find the amber piece. You have to determine that it's authentic. You have to find a way to polish it down in order to see the specimen clearly. And then you have to observe it very carefully 
and sometimes hours, sometimes days, weeks, months pass before you finally find the perfect situation in order to come to a final conclusion as to its identity. Usually, we can find some order, extent order, to put these insects in, these ancient insects from the, from the mid-Cretaceous, but in this case, we couldn't. There's about 35 extent insect orders, and they cover everything in general very well. And so to find something that doesn't fit in there is a rare occasion, a rare event, and something that, that I was really overjoyed with. <laughs> so there you go. A very interesting piece. I mean, I love that. Anything that reminds you of Jurassic Park, obviously, you know, I'm a huge mark for that. But I'm just going to say it was really interesting to actually look at pictures of this thing. You should look online and just look up this new alien-like insect. Just Google it. I'm sure the pictures will come up and you guys can check it out for yourselves. Okay? <laughs> I think it's awesome. Speaking of fossils and weird stuff, what if I told you, like, one of the cutest creatures in the world have, like, this gigantic ancestor that looks just like them. Guys, we all know otters are freaking adorable. But listen, fossils of a giant otter have recently been unearthed in China. This is a bit weird, but it's also pretty wild. Paleontologists have revealed the discovery of a prehistoric otter that was around the size of a wolf. Dating back over 6 million years and weighing in 100 pounds, 100 pounds, these huge semi-aquatic mammals were thought to have once thrived in the shallow swamplands of ancient China. The species was identified following the discovery of three partial skeletons and a complete skull and the mandible at a Shintoega site in northeastern Yunnan province, southwest China. While the cranium is incredibly complete, it was flattened during the fossilization process, said research team leader Dennis Su from the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. The bones were so delicate that we could not physically restore the cranium. Instead, we CT scanned the specimen and virtually reconstructed it on a computer. Twice the size of today's otter, these enormous animals possess powerful jaws and enlarged teeth that would have enabled them to crack open clams and other shellfish with ease. Oh, man. How cool is that? All right? How cool is that? I, I just love stories that are strange and weird, don't you? Now, listen, my guest... Tonight is from the UK, so I had to go find a little story from the UK, and uh, lo and behold, I found more than that. I found a missing city, a missing kingdom, actually. Now, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the name is Regid. So I'm just going to call it the Lost Kingdom of Regid, and it's found in Scotland. I could be wrong. Please don't hate me if I'm wrong, okay? Archaeologists believe that they have located the site of the Lost Kingdom dating back to the Dark Ages, the mysterious kingdom of Regid, which thrived in Britain in the 6th century, was destroyed at the beginning of the 7th, leaving behind very little in the way of an archaeological evidence to support it. Exactly where in Britain Regid was located has long remained something of a mystery. But now the work of two archaeologists, Ronan Toulis and Christopher Bowles, could be set to change all that. Back in 2012, an excavation of Trustees Hill in Galloway, Scotland, revealed tantalizing clues of a formal royal stronghold. It appeared that sometime around 600 AD, the summit had been heavily fortified with timber-laced stone ramparts and other supplementary defenses. This is a type of fort that has been recognized in Scotland as a form of high-status secular settlement of the early, early medieval period, said Tolis. The evidence makes a compelling case for Galloway being the core of the Kingdom of Regid. When Regid was finally destroyed in a fire in the 7th century, the flames were thought to have been burned so hot that parts of the ramparts actually melted and fused together. It was a blaze that may have lasted days or even weeks before finally dying down. The deliberate and spectacular destruction of Trusty Hills is a visceral reminder that the demise of this kingdom in the early 7th century AD came with sword and flame, the authors wrote. Very, very interesting. Oh, man. <laughs> Oh, God. So, there you go. A hidden hidden kingdom. How cool is that, man? I, I love the idea of castles and monsters and stuff like that. There's also another thing I love. I love the idea of haunted locations and haunted hotels. But, you know, I can't help but feel like the Guinness Book of World Records brought to light a haunted hotel that are just asking for it. Because, you know what? There's a haunted hotel, and now it boasts and has the Guinness Book of World Records seal approval for world's largest Ouija board. The Grand Midway Hotel in Pennsylvania is home to what is officially the largest Ouija board on planet Earth. 
Built more than a century ago, the Grand Mouvement Hotel has managed to attract the attention of numerous paranormal investigators, authors, and television producers over the last few years. The Grand Midway Hotel was an old coal mining hotel from the late 1880s, said filmmaker Blair Murphy, who, car- who currently lives in the building. I could recall countless ghost encounter stories from folks who have stayed there the night here, and it's just actually been a fascinating place to live. Blair came up with the idea of building a giant Ouija board on the roof of the hotel after having his own experiences with a regular size board a couple of years ago. Things flipped out throughout the hotel, he said. It seemed to kick things up into an entire new level of paranormal activity. We we were actually seeing floating people and hearing voices, and even the hotel pets were flipping out and reacting to unseen forces. The giant version of the board, which he built along with the help of eight artists, measures a whopping 121.01 square meters, and even features his own giant planchette. The hotel roof was this massive blank canvas and was just waiting for the perfect project to present itself, he said. A Ouija world record was a perfect match for our place. Guys, it's been a really strange month this month of January 2017, and I hope you enjoyed your paranormal news. You know, we talked about having an extra organ you didn't know about, a man who claimed to punch an alien right in the face, another man who claims to have actually discovered a new alien species of, of bug. We had scientists create gigantic frickin' lasers, a fossil of a giant otter, so cute, but it was a 100 pounds of cute, and of course the Honda Hotel with the world's largest Ouija board on top of it. Man, all these stories have been odd to Newfoundland. Alright guys, we're almost ready to dig in to oddities, 10 very strange facts that are very true about a very odd world, but first we're going to check in with our old friend Laura and see what's going on in the skies, man. It's time to get beamed up with the MUFON Minute. Take it away, Laura. Thanks, John. Welcome to your MUFON Minute for February 2017. I wish you all a very happy Valentine's Day. For many years, unknown aerial phenomenon has been witnessed in Great Britain. From religious pilgrims reporting glowing dragons in the 12th century, to scribes and friars reporting shining silver objects in the 13th century, there has been a long history of UFOs witnessed there. One of my favorite photographs in the UFO alien realm is the Solway Firth Spaceman photo. This was taken in 1964 by Jim Templeton. The photo was of his five-year-old daughter on a trip to Berg Marsh. Yet, when the photograph was developed, an unusual figure was actually in the background, one that he couldn't remember being there in person. It appeared like this figure was wearing a space suit. At the time, Kodak actually analyzed the photograph and confirmed that it was in fact genuine. The contemporary opinion is that it was actually Templeton's wife with her back to the camera and her dress was overexposed. One thing is certain is that people are still talking about this photograph all of these years later. And Templeton's story didn't actually end with the photograph. Two mysterious men showed up possibly men in black, insisting that they were for the government, refusing to give their names, only referring to themselves as numbers, and showed up after these photographs were published, asking all sorts of strange questions. Hmm, very strange if you ask me. In 1997, at Dark Peak and Howden Moor, a mysterious triangle was witnessed, and an hour later, two sonic booms were heard and recorded by observers. According to RAF reports, no supersonic aircraft was actually in the area at that time. However, they did assist in trying to search for any potential crashed aircraft. Helicopters, sniffer dogs, and over 150 volunteers searched tirelessly. However, no wreckage was ever found. In 2013, a pilot of an Airbus A320 experienced a very close encounter at 34,000 feet. An object passed extremely close to his commercial aircraft, so close in fact, that the captain ducked because he felt they were going to collide mid-air. One of the most well-known stories occurred in December of 1980, when there was an alleged landing of a spacecraft at Rendlesham Forest in Suffolk, England. 
This event is often referred to as British Britain's Roswell. USAF security personnel John Burroughs and Jim Penniston were the first to report strange lights. When they went out to investigate, they witnessed a craft landed in the woods outside of RAF bedwaters. This was actually a facility used by the U.S. during the Cold War. Colonel Charles Halt also witnessed the lights and states that an unknown object was indeed tracked during the incident. This story is a very complicated one with many facts and webs all connected together. Some suggest it was simply a top secret military project. A helicopter, maybe. Even there's been suggestions that it was a light from a nearby lighthouse. One thing is certain, something out of the ordinary happened in Rendlesham Forest that evening. It is certainly worth checking out the book Encounter in Rendlesham Forest, written by Nick Pope with John Burroughs and Jim Penniston, if you're interested in learning a bit more. Yet another UFO has been seen on NASA's International Space Station live stream. On January 20th at 11.30 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, a solid object was seen floating above the Earth. The object changed in size and lasted for approximately 25 seconds. Moments later, the live stream was dead. While there are many alternative explanations, such as reflections of lights from Earth or the space station itself, the witness insists that this object was definitely a UFO. Who knows? Remember, as you go on special night drives with your sweetie for Valentine's Day, keep your eyes to the skies. Between the snuggles, maybe take a look towards the stars. And who knows? You may have a few friends watching back at you. If you do see anything unusual, please report it to www.mufon.com. For all things UFO in Newfoundland and Labrador, please be sure to check out the Newfoundland and Labrador UFO Network on Facebook. Thanks so much, John. Thank God. It's time for oddities. Alive. It's alive. It's alive. Boy, that escalated quickly. I want to believe. Welcome to the desert of the real. Oddities. All right, guys, it's time to go for oddities. Ten very strange but very true facts about your odd, odd world. Did you know one quarter of the bones in your body are in your feet? Hmm. Interesting. Did you know, like fingerprints, everyone's tongue is different? Wow, that's an interesting one. Did you know your fingernails grow nearly four times faster than toenails? I I think you'd clip them a lot more if they were to grow a lot more, so... Let's be honest, you probably do your toenails once every now and then. Your fingernails seem to be all the time. And if you listen to this podcast and it genuinely freaks you out, you probably chew your fingernails off, so really don't cut them at all. I don't know, though. I don't know, though. I I think I'm an advocate. I'm going to say this. My toenails get cut every now and then. I don't even think it's one quarter as many times as my fingernails. (laughs) Did you know most dust particles in your house are made from dead skin? So there you go. Orbs really are dead people. (laughs) Uh, Oh, God. I can hear the para hate right now. But, John, orbs are real. Yeah. Orbs on video from two different camera angles are real. Did you know present the present population of 5 billion plus people of the world is predicted to become 15 billion by 2080? Whew. Well, thank God I'm not going to be around for that. Did you know women blink like nearly twice as much as men? Like, that's a lot. <laughs> I could totally see my wife doing that because she rolls her eyes a lot at me. Did you know Adolf Hitler was a vegetarian and had only one testicle? <laughs> I'm like, how is how is this an odd fact about our world? Adolf Hitler was a vegetarian and had only one testicle. I mean, mon fior, I got to know you only have one testicle. Did you know honey is the only food that does not spoil? I think that's really, really cool. Got to be the bee's knees, man. Got to be the bee's knees. Months that begin on a Sunday will always have a Friday the 13th. So there you go. Look that up on your calendar. Prove me wrong or prove me right. 
And the last oddity, and one that's going to make a quick pop forever, did you know Coca-Cola would be green if coloring weren't added to it? Oh, God. Ugh, thank God I drink Pepsi. Thank God. Guys, all these oddities, I hope you enjoyed them. We'll be right back with our guest, Mark McNichol, all the way from the United Kingdom. I bet you just can't wait to hear his story. It's a great one. Guys, stay tuned. Don't you dare go away. The following podcast is brought to you by Newfie EVP, Talking with the Dead in Newfoundland. Jump on Amazon.ca today and get your free sample of the best-selling ebook in Unexplained Mysteries. Attention all Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio listeners. The Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast brings you the best in East Coast esoterica on the first of every month. Together, we can keep it growing by sharing the show on social media, subscribing to the show wherever you may be listening to it from, and by leaving feedback about your favorite episodes. John certainly needs a friend like you to help make his dreams come true, minus the alien abduction dreams. That is not cool at all. The Odd to New Finland Paranormal Podcast. Always available. Always free. Always odd. And welcome back to the Odd to New Finland Paranormal Podcast. Tonight's guest is an author of many books, Coconut Bowser, and also Finn the Cool Rises. He served on the management board of the Foundation of Writers in Scotland and is currently working on a spiritualized paranormal themed picture film feature in Manchester called The Dreaded Light. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's guest is Mark McNichol. Mark, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for taking the time to be on the podcast. We really do appreciate that. I'm trying my best in 2017 to get this podcast worldwide, and I thought I'd make a little trip to Glasgow. Well, uh, you're, you're more than welcome anytime, and your listeners. <laughs> great stuff. Now, Mark, first and foremost, i got to put this out there. The Dreaded Light. Right away, we, we hear Dreaded Light, we think of horror movie. Am I correct? Yes. Okay, so tell me a little tiny bit about The Dreaded Light and how this came about. Well, um, the fir first of all, I decided that I was going to, because um, my background's writing, um, and, you know, I've been writing full time for about maybe oh, seven years now. Uh, the majority of my experience is in novels and also stage plays. Uh, so I've written a couple of novels, uh, written, directed, and produced a few stage plays. Um, but then I kind of turned my focus to screen. Um, did a master's degree in screenwriting in Scotland. Uh, and um, I spent three months in LA. And then I really kind of started working on um, television and film scripts and trying to, you know, trying to, trying to sell them. Um, which obviously it's one thing writing a script, it's another thing actually selling the script. Um, it's a big, you know, it's a big, big challenge. So I, um, I mean, I've been on it now for, oh, maybe three years, uh, kind of pretty much focusing exclusively on screenwriting. And I've got, what, three or four feature film scripts, um, kind of doing the rounds. Uh, with, you know, my agents got them with different producers and they're making progress, but as yet, none of them have been, um, produced. So I made the decision that I was going to use, uh, I basically made the decision that I was going to, uh, produce one of my own scripts on a micro budget. So that was the first thing that happened. I made that decision first. So then I had to, you know, come up with, I had to decide, uh, what the story was going to be about. Um, and that was when I, I made the decision that I was going to, um, kind of, um, I was going to use something that happened to my mum when I was a teenager. And, um, the nature of what happened to my mum when I was a teenager, um, kind of drew me into horror. Okay. So now this is where I got to stop because this is a paranormal podcast. Now, yeah. Mark. I'm going to throw this out here to you. Yes. You got to tell me <laughs> what happened. <laughs> we got to know. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, the, the, there's an intro video on my website, uh, markmcnichol.com, M-A-R-K-M-A-C-N-I-C-O-L.com. Now, that intro video goes into a bit more detail, okay? But the general gist of it is when I was about 15, uh, my mum was... Um, approached by 
someone who she had never met. She didn't know this person. Um, the person, first of all, asked if my mum would mind, you know, kind of um, speaking to her about this subject. And my mum was receptive. My mum said, yeah, that's fine. So the mum, um, the, the, the woman introduced herself to my mum as a medium. And she said, I have a message for you from your oldest. And my mum said, well, that's not possible because Mark is my oldest and he's still with us. And the medium said, well, no, Mark's not your oldest because the year before Mark was born, you had a baby and her name was Angela. Now, <laughs> now that is true. My mum did have a baby and um, the baby didn't make it. Um, and the baby, the baby was called Angela. And, uh, in fact, my mum really didn't make it. My mum was in a bad way. She had like, I think she had two or three blood transfusions. She was in a coma for like a week. Um, wow. so it was touch and go whether my mum was going to make it out of hospital. But tragically, when my mum woke up, um, she was told that the baby hadn't made it. In fact, the baby had been buried by my dad and his, and his parents, my grandparents. Um, and where the baby was buried is actually in the intro video that's on my website, The Grave, because it's actually a family plot. Um, so, and it's an amazing, um, it's quite a historically significant church in Scotland. It dates back to the 1600s. There's lots of, um, you know, really kind of historical figures uh, buried in the graveyard. And it's also got quite a geographically prominent position because it's halfway between Glasgow and Edinburgh and it sits on a hill overlooking the main motorway between Scotland's two biggest cities and it's lit up at night and it's very, you know, it's very atmospheric. Sounds um, very beautiful. So, you know, that, that was, um, so my mum obviously was like, you know, what, what the heck's going on here? Never met this woman. Um, but she knows, she knew my name was Mark and she knew, um, the baby's name was Angela, um, and she said, so um, I have a message from Angela, and the message is for Mark, and Angela wants uh, wants Mark to know that he has a big sister in the spirit world, and she's always with him, she's always watching out for him, she is his guardian angel. Um, so that happened when I was 15, and, you know, I have grown up uh Probably as a result of that, um, I would describe myself as someone who, you know, when it comes to the continuation of spirit after physical death, most people kind of fall into three categories. They're either closed to the possibility, uh, they're open to the possibility, or they're kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, and based on that experience, I would say that I have lived my adult life to date definitely open to the possibility of the continuation of spirit after physical death. So <clears throat> I made the decision that, um, you know, I mean, I'm not making a documentary. I'm a fiction writer. So um, whilst the feature film will be inspired by that event, um, it's not a, you know, it is a, it is a work of fiction. So I did certain things with the story in order to put some distance between what happened to me and my mum and Angela and what's in the film. But it's obvious that whilst things have been changed, the story has come from, you know, has, has come from my real life experience in terms of, um, in terms of uh, inspiration. And then what a great thing to be inspired by a man. 15 years old, that's a pretty impressionable age to have a brush with the paranormal. I think that's great. Uh, some yes. people might think it's a little strange. Some people might think it's a little odd, but I think it's a it's a comforting thought to think that you have a guardian angel, somebody actually looking out after you at all times. Uh, you know, one thing Mark is going to say is that we we usually don't believe in the paranormal. Most people don't. Me, I am a believer because I'm an investigator. You, on mm -hmm. the other hand, have had an experience that you did not ask for. You didn't go looking for it. Uh, has anything mm -hmm. else strange or paranormal ever happened to you over the course? So, well, since then, we'll say. Well, I would say um, yes, and um, <clears throat> specifically when I made the decision that I was going to start, uh, that I was going to produce this feature film, um, 
you know, the way that I put it together, I kept the number of characters and locations to a minimum because I knew <clears throat> I knew I was going to produce it on a micro budget. Um, but something that's very important to me as a, a you know as a fiction writer is authenticity, and uh, you know the the irony the irony of good fiction is that it has to be real. Um, so I started the process of doing um, research, which is a uh, fairly standard. You know, or it should be a fairly standard process for fiction writers. You know, um, if you're writing about a particular topic or subject, then obviously it's you know it's a kind of given that you would do research into that area. So what I started to do was I started to really do as much research as possible into uh, into the concept of the continuation of spirit after physical death. So I, I interviewed lots of people. Um, I attended uh, spiritualist services. I um, had uh, readings done by um, psychic and clairvoyant mediums. Um, and um, you know, <laughs> what can I tell you? It was, uh, you know, it's been a it has been a fascinating journey for me. The research side of things, because um, I mean. We're talking about uh, basically my dead friends and relatives giving me messages from beyond the grave. You know, uh, things that um, obviously, you know, when you have a an encounter with a medium, uh, again, their information is going to, is going to fall into three categories. You know, some of it is completely generic and could be, could apply to anyone. Some of it is kind of in the middle, and it might apply to you, but it might apply to someone else. And then there's and then there's the other stuff where they just nail it, you know. They just tell you like, um, you know, things that they cannot possibly know. And to me, like that adds so much more credibility to a medium or a psychic or anybody who does claim to have the gift. When they hit things right between the eyes, man, it's when they do yeah. that that it really makes me feel like there's something to that phenomena. And just like a lot of other things out there, I'm sure you've taken inspiration from them. You know, one of the things I had to ask you is, I'm not saying I'm a huge horror buff, but I do have a few friends in the, shall we say, horror genre, who mm -hmm. just, I love campy stuff. Like, my good friend, Bill Oberst Jr., he, he played Abraham Lincoln in Abraham Lincoln vs. the Zombies. He, he played that, like a, like it was like a D movie on Netflix. It was so much fun to watch though, right? Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I, I want to know though, who, who inspires you? Like, from, from, say, those genres. Like, me, when I think of when I was, say, oh, eight or nine years old, I, I think of Freddy Krueger as, like, my go-to horror guy. Uh, who, who, you know, what kind of creatures or, or monsters, shall we say, in horror are, are yeah. ones that you love? Well, you know what? I think it's, I mean, it's interesting because for me, um, I mean, I don't consider myself to be a horror writer mm -hmm. um, or, or, a, or a horror storyteller because, like, Audiences tend not to do this, but on the business side, whether it be agents or producers or whoever, they want to put you in a box. So, you know, and it tends to be the box that they want to put you in tends to be the first thing that you, you know, that generates critically and critical and or commercial success. So you could have been working for seven years and then, <clears throat> you know, you uh, write, produce or direct a horror film. Um, and then all of a sudden you're a, you're a horror writer. You know, so for me, the first, the, the thing that comes first is the story. And if the story is engaging, compelling, it's interesting, you know, you are, you're, you're buying into that world, um, then to a certain extent, it doesn't matter what the genre is to me. I will watch horror, science fiction, uh, you know, uh, children's animation, I, I don't care what it is. If, if if I'm buying it, if it's an interesting story, then I'm on board. But specifically, when we look at m my relationship with horror, um, and this is another thing that's interesting to me because through my research, I've been um, interviewing people about their individual relationship with horror, and it's a genre that um, that has a very kind of unique. Um, profile in that regard because you know pretty much most of us have a, have a, 
a, a very unique relationship with horror. And when you actually look at our relationship with horror and why we have that relationship, it tends to be different for each person. So, for example, I have got some friends and family who will not watch horror. They just refuse to watch any horror. My wife, yeah. <laughs> my wife will not watch any horror. She hates it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what's interesting is when you start to drill down into the, you know, and you start to speak to the person about why do they hate it. Quite often, they don't even know. Quite often, they just have this kind of knee-jerk reaction. Um, but I find it really interesting to to speak to people and ask them the reasons why they hate horror. But for me. When I look at like my relationship with horror, I have definitely been someone who avoided um, a particular subgenre of horror. Now, horror um, as a genre is again probably fairly unique, just because it's so massive and there are so many subgenres that come from the main genre. Um, but certainly, and, uh, and again, there aren't many genres that have their own dedicated film festivals and have such a, you know, a kind of ferocious international, fa- you know, audience base, fan base. Um, but when I look at, um, I, historically, even before I was a, even before I was a writer, like going through my, my teenage years and my twenties, um, I could pretty much watch, I could pretty much watch any horror with the exception of one particular subgenre, which just terrified me, um, if it was done well. And that, and that specifically was supernatural. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, if I, off the top of my head, things like the exorcism of Emily Rose, I mean, I had, I, I had nightmares for about two weeks after watching that film, you know? Um, and I think, I mean, I could watch, you know, like found footage, like slasher movies, trapped in a basement, you know, all of that stuff. I could watch it. Um, you know, I could watch it fine. But anything with spirit and um, historically, and it might be because of what happened when I was fifteen. Because if you if you're closed if you're closed minded to spirit and you don't believe in the continuation of spirit after physical death, then Watching something like The Exorcism of Emily Rose is going to be a walk in the park for you. But if you're open to the idea um, that spirit continues after physical death, then shit like that is not going to be so easy for you. Well, I, I can definitely vouch for you right there. I am bored to death when I watch ghost hunting shows. I'm bored to death because I do it on the weekends myself. <laughs> so I can totally relate to that. Um, one thing I will say, though, to see that belief and, and to see it actually take a little bit of your work with you. It's interesting mm-hmm. that they're both connected that way, you know? There's so many people out there who mm-hmm. do similar things to what me and you do and love to do it, and you always wonder what their motivations are. But just imagine, yeah. Mark McNichols' reason to want to make movies it really is to connect, is to get out there and let people know, hey, listen, this stuff's yeah. real. <laughs> this is for real. Yeah. It's based, and there's always a grain of truth in the most far-fetched of stories. You know, there's always that little well, grain of truth. Yeah, but the, 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 the other interesting thing is, um, it's not my business to tell people that the spirit continues after physical death, right? It's their business. It's their business to care. Mm-hmm. And see, see if they don't care, then that's totally fine. I have no problem with people who don't, you know, who, who, who have no interest in the idea that sp- spirit continues. But what I find quite bizarre is that, um, you know, I've met a few people who uh, have been quite violently opposed to the idea and quite, you know, verbally aggressive. I mean, even people, you know, I've even met people at dinner parties and stuff in very, you know, in very civilised um, social surroundings. And um, when, if we get onto this subject, uh, I've met a few people who are aggressively against the idea of, um, of the, the continuation of spirit um, out with the traditional religious infrastructure. And, um, you know, that... What, but, yet, but see, when you actually start to drill into it, what you, often, what you often discover is they have done zero research. Now, they're talking to somebody who's invested many hours days and weeks and months into researching this subject um, 
and yet they have done none. Now, the funny thing for me is, the idea of what happens to our spirit after death, can't think of anything more important. Mm-hmm. Wow. And now you know why my email address is lifeafterdeathsociety at gmail.com. <laughs> you know, my dealings, I come from that atheist background, and I'm not leaving this planet as an atheist, let me tell you. It's just not going to yeah. happen. I tried. I tried. But guess what? Yeah. Every time I went on a hunt, every time I caught EVP, the voices, my father, my father's stories is... is It'll blow your mind. My father is the longest living liver cancer patient with his particular type of liver cancer in, in Atlantic Canada. And wow. it's got nothing to do with the drugs and everything to do with his belief in God. He's a big on prayer. It's mindset. Mm -hmm. I think what mm -hmm. it is, people kind of connect the idea of God and religion, mm -hmm. but they forget that there's still room for spiritualism, even without the big book, so to speak. You know what I mean? There's something to be said for having the right like we all have a moral compass we all have a moral mm. compass why if we're all just monkeys why it, it makes well, no sense the, and the other thing is that um something that i found really interesting going through my research is there's a lot of baggage gets attached to certain words um so um if we look at two words and we look at the baggage that gets attached to them uh, so the two words that that I would offer up is number one, paranormal, and number two, spiritualism. Now, those two words mean very, very different things to practically every person that you speak to. But one thing I would say about spiritualism is that spiritualism is no joke, you know? And um, if you take the time to actually find out the location of your nearest um, spiritualist church and you go along like I have done um, in fact I'll tell you a story about the, the very first time I ever attended a spiritualist church service and I was well first of all I mean I come from a kind of evangelical um, Christian upbringing um, my grandfather was actually a pastor and um, so I was brought up through my childhood in a, a kind of evangelical Baptist um, type type upbringing. So I spent a lot of time in church, and I spent a lot of time being exposed to the scriptures. Um, so one of, one of the first things I was really surprised by, and now this is in the UK and Scotland, I went to my local spiritualist church in Glasgow, um, and the first thing that I was struck by was how similar uh, the service was to a Christian service in terms of there being prayer and there being hymns and there being um, sermons. Uh, the only difference was that at the end of the service, there was a demonstration of mediumship where uh, a medium came on the stage and started to uh, pass messages from uh, friends and family to the, to the congregation. Um, now, I was sitting there. I didn't know one person in that place. And um, the medium pointed in my direction. And she said, uh, there's so, so one of you, and then there's a guy behind me. She says, which one of you two is the writer? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty accurate right off the bat. Never laid eyes yeah. on you before. Wow. So I turned around and the guy was shaking his head. He was like, nah, no me. And I was like, well, it's me. And then she started to, you know, um, kind of pass messages on from, uh, from friends and family who have deceased. Um, and she, uh, she, you know, she said, listen, um, the project, my understanding from spirit is that the project that you're working on is, um, spiritualist themed. Uh, they want you to get a move on with it. Mm. You know, now shit like that is just—it's um, pretty mind blowing. Like, and I, I'm lucky because if it wasn't for this project, I wouldn't have been doing the research that I've been doing, so I wouldn't have had the opportunity. I, I didn't go to that, and this is—it's kind of sad in some respects. The fact that I didn't go to that church because I had any interest in finding out what happens to my spirit after physical death. I went to that church because I was researching a feature film. <laughs> 
I was trying to get famous by capturing the voices of the dead people. Don't feel bad. <laughs> that's, that's the beautiful thing about spirit, Mark. That's the beautiful thing about it. Guess what? It's going to creep up on you. There's nothing yeah. scarier than the truth. And the truth is, nobody knows what happens to us when we die. But we got a pretty good inkling. We got a pretty well, good inkling. Well, I mean, there's another two words that I find quite interesting, and that's um, the word proof and and the word evidence. And, um, you know, I mean, what I don't have is any proof. But what I do have is a truckload of evidence. Uh, and I think, to be honest with you, no one is ever going to find any proof. Because I believe that the way this, this, you know, this stage play that we're all starting in has been, or this feature film that we're all starting in has been set up. It's been set up in such a way that we each go on our own, you know, spiritual journeys. Um, and, um, if someone like you, you or me was to, you know, uh, deliver a piece of evidence which was irrefutable and could not, you know, and was scientifically, you just could not argue with it, um, then to a certain extent, um, that journey, the journey element for each spirit would be taken away. And I, that's why I don't think anyone will ever find proof. Because if you find proof, then the faith element is removed and each individual spirit no longer has their own individual journey to take. And here's something I can share with you on that exact subject because it's something that keeps me awake at night because I think, believe it or not, the proof might be in that data or evidence. And I'm going to tell you this right now, just between me and you and everyone who's mm -hmm. listening at home, of course, <laughs> I'm going to throw this out yeah. there. It seems to me that there are rules when it comes to electronic voice phenomena, which is what I deal with, the voices of the dead. Mm -hmm. Never have I got an EVP that says we're ghosts, God are real, there's an afterlife. It's always just very subtle yeah. hints. They're not, yeah. it almost as if they're not allowed to tell you. Full mm -hmm. disclosure is, is part of it. And it might have something to do with the fact that there's rules over there. Maybe yeah. the rules over there, maybe I'm not allowed to catch that piece of irrefe irrefutable data, we'll say, that proves mm -hmm. that there's an afterlife. That's a really interesting concept. And I'm so glad me and you, I can see now how me and you, are connected very, very well on that same wavelength. Yeah, yeah. The, another interesting thing is um, the idea of, uh, like, proof. The idea of proof and, and, and evidence and, and, and me doing that research. Another thing that came up in terms of the authenticity element of it, pretty much every spiritualist that I met has a major downer on the horror genre. And the reason that they have a major downer is because it constantly portrays the world of spirit in a negative light. Yeah. And that was some, you know, that was something that I struggled with because, you know, if you're writing a, if you're writing a horror film, then, you know, to a certain extent, it's kind of your job to, to scare people. And that's why 99% of horror writers, uh, focus on demons and, you know, specifically within that subgenre, focus on demons and, you know, evil spirits and, you know. And I can 100% um, agree with you, and here's the reason why. I got a lot of buddies who do a lot of podcasting about the paranormal. You know, I can think of 10 mm -hmm. off the top of my head, but I'm going to say to you right now, we've all agreed on one thing. Our numbers mm -hmm. go through the roof almost double every time we put the yeah. word demon in the title yeah. of our yeah. podcast. It's as simple as that. Because <laughs> people, people want to be scared. Yes. You, know, you go, you go back millennia when we were sitting around campfires and, um, you know, probably the most, uh, you know, the most sought after storyteller was the, was the caveman who could tell a scary story. <laughs> because it's just, a, it's just in us, you know, um, we just, uh, we just kind of like being scared, but that doesn't help that, you know, that doesn't help spiritualists find a way of being okay with horror films because every spiritualist that you speak to, um, has pretty much, you know, is very, very enthusiastic and positive about the world of spirit. Um, and, uh, so it's a problem, you know, so it's a problem. And it's interesting because I've, I've been, I've had a massive amount of support in the UK from, um, many, many spiritualists, but in particular, um, the SNU, uh, the, which is the kind of national, um, union of spiritualists in the UK. Uh, I've met with several of their members 
um, and uh, one of their board members, and they were, you know, they were a big, big help, trying to help me find a way to tell a horror story in such a way that it was done authentically without taking the piss out of them and without, um, you know, and, and, and without portraying um, spirit as as um, negative and evil because pretty much every spiritualist that I've spoken to, it's interesting because one of the things that I've asked them is, can you explain to me where evil spirits go? Because no spiritualists actually dispute the fact that evil spirits exist. You know, it's clear that some people on the earth plane currently are evil or were evil before they died. So if the spirit continues, where do they go? And based on my research, the general consensus is that evil spirits go to a dimension where they, um, in terms of the natural order of things, they should not be able to come back. The only spirits that should be able to come back are the loving, kind, generous, open-hearted spirits who mean to support us and, you know, and nurture us and help us along our, along our path. Um, so that is, um, that's an interesting one. The idea of, um, where do they go? <laughs> and well, are there circumstances under which they could come back? Because, like, things like, you know, so demons, for example, and evil spirits. Uh, obviously, there's lots of people out there who talk about their encounters with demons and their encounters with evil spirits. So either they're lying or the spiritualists are mistaken. So it's a fascinating, point. you know, it's a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating subject, specifically the idea of where does evil go and can it come back? Well, I know one thing. I would love for people, I know where I want them to go. I want them to go to www.markmcnichol.com and help this fella who took the time today to be on this super awesome podcast. And let me tell you, 30 minutes just flew. Like, where'd it go? Went completely crazy. I'm going to say this. I want you guys to get on that website and I want you to help Mark out. I want you to help him get this out there. I want that movie. Okay. I want his film, The Dreaded Light to get out there and for people to see it. Because let me tell you, I got chills. The first moment I seen him walk into a graveyard and say, my mother was visited by a medium. As soon as I seen that, I said, I got to get this guy on my podcast. There's something to this guy. I've never met Mark before. This is the first time I've ever talked to him. In fact, he even helped me talk to him today because my Skype crapped out. <laughs> I will say this, Mark, thank you so much for being on the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. I'm a big fan of your work and... Um, a massive hello from the UK to all of your international listeners. I hear the UK got the highest numbers on the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast last year. Guess what? We're going to keep it higher. I'm going to get this out there. It's going to be all over Twitter. It's going to drop on the 1st of February. And I think I might call this podcast from Mark Nickel with love and demons and I like stuff. <laughs> I like it. That's got a nice ring to it. Yeah, I think I like that too. Thank you so much for being on today. Thank you. Well, the time to say goodbye is upon us. But don't worry, you can keep track of the Odd and Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast very easily. It's available on Stitcher, iTunes, Podbean, and TuneIn Radio. Just look for the Odd and Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast banner. Of course, if you'd like to keep up to date, you can always check out the Odd and Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast Facebook page, drop a like, and every single time a new show goes up, you'll be notified. You can also follow me, John Mallard, on Twitter, at O-D-D-T-O-N-F-L-D. That's odd to Newfoundland. Get your latest news on the podcast as well as the ever-popular para-joke of the day. From the oldest city in North America, I bid you adieu. From the odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast.